has a character. Secondly, the city becomes a power. Thirdly, the city is fallen. Not demonized, it's fallen. <clears throat> There's some legitimate ends, some that are not. There's some good things, some bad things. But it is flawed. Fourthly, because of its fallenness, its drive is for survival. And its drive is idolatrous. In other words, the city wants to be God in the lives of its people. I remember <clears throat> some time ago reading an article in the Harvard Business Review about the selection of uh, executives for top slots in American corporations. This article said if you're on the short list for one of those jobs, <clears throat> the fact that you had a good marriage would be a black mark against you. You know why? If you've got a good marriage, the reasoning is his, his loyalty is divided. Part of his commitment, part of his motivation, part of his loyalty would be for his family, his <clears throat> wife and his family. And I'd rather take a man who is divorced, whose marriage was on nothing, you know what, because they could get the lot. Now, the, <clears throat> the, the idolatrous drive of the powers is, I think, in these days of recession, is, uh, is quite brutal. In a seminar <clears throat> I was taking in England, a couple of guys came up to me afterwards. One, one said this, he said, last uh, week <clears throat> when I was at the church meeting, my manager rang up. And my wife said, well, George is not here. He's at the church meeting. And the voice on the other end of the line, on the other end of the line <clears throat> said, what on earth is he doing at a church meeting? He's supposed to be at home doing his paperwork. I want him on the road tomorrow. Another fellow worked for an insurance company. He said, we are drilled. But the last, last thing you have in your mind before you fall asleep is your calls next day. The first thing you have to think about while you're in the shower in the morning is how you're going to spend your day. <clears throat> now, there's something... There's something uh, uh, that's trying to swallow people up there. That, that's the idolatrous drive of the city. It wants to be the ultimate authority in people's lives. Now, idolatry inevitably leads to demonization. So the city is demonized. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for city in the Old Testament <clears throat> has a second meaning. And the second meaning of the word is the watching angel. The watching angel is a demon god behind the city. And the Bible names a large number of them. <clears throat> Baal, for example, Dagon, Nebo, Chemosh, Moloch, Ashtoreth, full of them. They were the demon gods who ruled behind the city. So in the world today, <clears throat> God is facing rebellion at three levels. And our struggle, as far as the city is concerned, is also at these three levels. Level one is the human level, flesh and blood. And the thrust there, obviously, is evangelism. Level two is the superhuman level. The fallen structures. <clears throat> and the struggle there is largely ideological. Level three is a supernatural. The demonic powers. And that's the level of strategic spiritual warfare. Turn your Bible to Ephesians 6, 12. <clears throat> well, 
well-known passage where Paul is speaking about spiritual warfare. <clears throat> and he mentions these three, at least implicitly, these three levels. <clears throat> Verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that's people, humans. And remember, in, the, all, in, in all of these areas, <clears throat> people are never the enemy. It's not flesh and blood. People are never, never the enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. That's the structural level. Level two. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's the supernatural level, level three. So God faces rebellion <coughs> against his will at all three of those levels. Rebellious human beings, fallen structures, the rebellious city, beginning with Babylon, Babel, and the, and the rebellious demonic powers. <clears throat> now the important thing to understand out of all this is with all its fallenness, with all its <coughs> demonic power behind it, the city is not a lost cause. Hallelujah. The city is not a lost cause. One of the marvelous things is that even in spite of its fallenness, God does not abandon his creation. I don't think we've fully understood the importance of the incarnation. The incarnation is God's ultimate commitment to the work of his hands. <coughs> In the incarnation, God became personally part of the created order. That's why I'm convinced <coughs> that what the Bible says when it talks about God making all things new does not mean God making all new things. I don't believe this world is going to end up in a dead star or a random flux or an atomic war or any kind of demolition like that. That would make us the survivors of creation. The Bible says we're the first fruits of creation. And the reason for that is that Jesus Christ himself has become part of the created order. He has become part of humanity. And he's never put that human nature off. God has not abandoned his fallen creation. And Romans chapter 13, which I think sometimes is misunderstood, when it says there is no power except of God, does not mean that God has approved of all the powers in existence now. It means that God maintains in existence the power structures. Otherwise the world would fall into chaos. And the reason for God uh, maintaining them in existence is because they are the objects of redemption. They are the objects of redemption. The city is not a lost cause. It's needed purged of, of its rebellion, freed from its demonic oppression. The city is required for the age to come. <clears throat> now here's the point I want to, <clears throat> want to explore. If you look at first century Palestine, <clears throat> the nation into which Jesus came, you find there was a country that was under the powers, totally in the control of the powers. For example, it was controlled by a very strong military power, the Roman Empire. Palestine was an occupied country. There were foreign troops everywhere. The military power was in total sway. Secondly, it was under a very harsh legalistic religious power. The synagogue and the Sanhedrin. So legalistic they tried to assassinate Jesus just because he healed on the Sabbath day. Synagogues are dangerous places for Jesus to go to. Thirdly, it was crushed under a very oppressive economic power. The Herodians. They were the people who farmed the taxes out to the publicans, bled the economy white and kept most of the population in abject poverty. In other words, Palestine was under the heel of the powers. They were in total control. That's a structural dimension. <clears throat> Worse than all of those, the nation was under demonic power. The 
power of Satan. <coughs> if you read the Old Testament, you find hardly any references in the Old Testament to demonized people. I mean, there's a few references to spirit mediums and false prophets and so, so on, but relatively few references to evil spirits. And certainly, as far as I can discover, no record of any deliverance. Unless perhaps some of the ritual cleansing of the mosaic system may have been exorcisms, which may well have been the case. But very little reference to demonized people. When you come to the gospel record, there are demonized people all over the place, aren't there? <clears throat> Man, they're popping out of the woodworks. I don't know the whole story, but I suspect that the devil uh, knew that something was afoot. And there may very likely have been a massive infestation of demonic power into, into first century Palestine. The whole nation, it seems, was very heavily demonized. And it was into this situation here. That, that's what the Bible calls <clears throat> when the fullness of times has come. Couldn't have got much worse, could it? When the fullness of times has come. Things were as black as they could possibly be. And into that setting there, there comes an in, uh, invasion from outer space. There's the incarnation. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why the life of Jesus is told four times over in the Bible? I mean, if God says something once, it's important. If he says it twice, you better not miss it. But not once, twice, three times, but four times, that man's life is told in complete detail in the scripture. Why? Because that's the heart of everything. That is the heart of everything. I think I read the Gospels probably six times as much as I read any other part of Scripture these days, except perhaps the Old Testament prophets, who are very, very topical these days. Because I'm just fascinated to look at that man, <clears throat> see the way Jesus lived, see the way he behaved, the way, the way he spoke, what his tone of voice must have been like, what his eyes must have looked like when he said some of the things he said. I don't know if you can, if you can imagine, conceptually, I think it's almost impossible to, for us to imagine what that man must have been like. When the devil said to Jesus, bow down and worship me and you can have all the kingdoms of the earth, that was nonsense. Jesus could have taken the world over any time he wanted to. You understand that? And this is not by any divine power either. Just by the sheer moral force of one absolutely whole, absolutely perfect, absolutely uncorrupted human personality. We've got no idea the amount of willpower Jesus could have generated if he wanted to. I think he could have gone to the Senate in Rome, made a declaration, Caesar get down off the throne, I have taken the world out. If he'd put his will to it, nobody could have resisted him. Now that man lived amongst the powers, and Jesus lived a life amongst the powers that was absolutely and totally free. Amazing, see. Now, none of us are free. We can be controlled by one of two things. One is greed and the other is fear. Every man's got his price. Every man's got his breaking point. And the powers are well, are well aware of that. <clears throat> powers in the city are well aware, aware of that. You can seduce or frighten anybody into submission. Isn't that right? Almost anybody, anyway. But what do you do with a man who's got no greed and no fear? <clears throat> you can't do anything. Foxes of holes says Jesus, birds of the air have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Doesn't want to be, didn't want a bit of it there. I think we've got a picture in our mind of, a, of Jesus with a kind of a sad look on his face when he said that. I think he was almost hilarious. He didn't want any of it. It all belonged to his father as it was. He had no greed whatsoever. And the man had no fear. He's in the boat with the disciples on the lake and that demon-inspired storm that had the disciples absolutely rational with terror They'd been in many storms before. They were fishermen. Something strange about that storm. See? They wake Jesus up and say, don't you care we're perishing? I mean, it's illogical. They were in the same boat. They were perishing. He was perishing. See? I've got a picture in my mind of Jesus standing up in the boat, rubbing the sleep out of his eyes and asking the question, why are you afraid? What do you do with a man who's got no greed and no fear? You can't do anything. See? And all his life, Jesus demonstrated his absolute freedom from the powers. It's incredible. <clears throat> he goes around the sin synagogue, not just accidentally casting out demons and healing the sick because he was too compassionate to wait till Monday. He was doing it deliberately. Mark says he went around all their synagogues casting out demons and healing the sick. If he was doing it in a synagogue, he was always doing it on the Sabbath day. Why? Because he's thumbing his nose to the synagogue. He's refusing to submit to the spirit of the synagogue, see. 
They came to him one time and they said, look, you better get out of here. Herod is going to kill you. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, go and tell that old fox. He wasn't a bit impressed. Go and tell that old fox that Jesus is going to do miracles today and tomorrow. The third day I'm going to be taken after him. He stands in front of Pilate. <coughs> Pilate said, don't you understand? I've got power to crucify you and power to let you go. If you read the story dispassionately, it's like Jesus explaining something to a slightly backward five-year-old. He said, you don't have any power at all unless it's given to you from above. No wonder Pilate was scared there. What's more, Jesus goes out into the wilderness <coughs> and he faces up the strong man himself. I suspect it may have been Jesus looking for the devil in the wilderness, not the other way around. It took six weeks for him to hunt him down. But when he did... <coughs> He faces him up eyeball to eyeball and masters the prince of darkness himself. I would like to have seen that. Hiding behind a rock, safety thing. But first, nobody ever faced the devil like that. See. Never again, Jesus establishes his absolute moral mastery over the devil. Never again did the devil ever dare to face Jesus man to man. See. Always worked behind the scenes after that because you know, he knew he was beaten. And Jesus lived all his human life like that demonstrating his absolute total freedom over the powers. <coughs> now here's a strange thing. When he came to the end of his ministry, <coughs> Jesus surrenders to the powers. He surrenders to the religious power. They take him off and inter interrogate him for hours and hours and hours. They hand him over to the military power. The military power takes him out and crucifies him on the cross. The economic power strips him stark naked and gambles his clothes away. Strangest of all, he surrenders to demonic power. When Jesus hung on the cross and the sky was dark, it wasn't nature hiding its face or any poetic metaphorical imagery like that, I don't think. It was the hour of darkness, see. He said before the cross, this is your hour and the power of darkness. There was one moment in all eternity, one place in the entire universe, just once, the devil had everything in his hands. He had the Logos, the eternal Son of God, a willing, helpless victim in his hands, and he crucified him. And that was his undoing, see. That was his undoing. <clears throat> In Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, rather, there is an amazing passage where Paul is speaking about the wisdom of the cross and about the rulers of this age, the demonic powers that engineered the death of Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, A wisdom <clears throat> which none of the rulers of this age understood, because if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you understand what Paul means? What Paul is saying is this. If the devil had had any idea about what was going to happen on the cross. He would have leveled every tree in Palestine rather than let them use one to crucify the Lord of glory. He never understood until too late what was going to happen there. Because Jesus, by his death and resurrection from the dead, Colossians 2.15, disarmed the powers. He disarmed the principalities and powers. And disarming the powers, he rescued power. There. He redeemed power itself. What was there about the death of Jesus that disarmed the power? Powers, rather. It wasn't his death as death, although it had something to do with it as far as our sin was concerned. His death was God's judgment on our sin. But what was it about Jesus' death that disarmed the powers? It wasn't his surrender to the powers. You don't overcome evil just by surrendering to evil. And the Holocaust and Paul Parton and the Balkan War will tell you that, see. What was there about the death of Jesus that disarmed the powers? I'll tell you what it was. It was death in obedience. Death in obedience. He was obedient to death, even death on the cross, Philippians tells us. <clears throat> what is the energy that drives the powers? The energy that drives the powers is rebellion. Rebellion against the throne of God, rebellion against the will of God, rebellion against the word of God, rebellion. All the energy in the city is rebellious against God. And Jesus faces that rebellion with obedience and obedience and obedience. You see, if you look at the record, the death of Jesus makes no sense apart from this perspective. 
For example, why did they treat Jesus the way they did? What was this mindless senselessness about flogging a man who's going to die in a few hours? Of, of mocking a man and brutalizing a human body that's only got hours left. What's the sense in that? What were the powers doing there? What was the point in, in mocking Jesus like the man gasping for breath up there on the cross and they say, come on down from the cross. If you're the Son of God, jump down, come on. Jump down, won't hurt you. Come on down, come on down. What are they doing? See? The powers were trying to stir in the heart of Jesus a tiny flicker of rebellion. That would have been their only hold on him. You understand? Just a little bit of self-preservation, a little bit of resistance to the Father's will, just a tiny little bit of yourself. All, all that was, a, was aimed at that, see. And they failed. They failed. He was obedient, 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 and eventually his obedience exhausted the rebellion of the power, see. It debilitated the energy that was there, see. It neutralized that rebellion. That rebellion. In the end, even death had to give up, see. Jesus comes back from the dead. And he has done two things. He has established his authority over all the powers. Now, when Colossians says he has disarmed the principalities and powers, which powers does it mean? The structural powers or the demonic powers? Answer, both. He said, now all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, spiritual and temporal. He has established his absolute lordship over them all. That's critical. We'll see in a few moments about our attitude towards the power, see. <clears throat> and having disarmed the powers, he has rescued power itself. Let me deal with that one first. The redemption of power. <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2... <clears throat> The cross of Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. What's Paul actually talking about? What does that mean? The cross of Christ is the power of God. <clears throat> On the cross, Jesus redeemed power. And the power that flows from the cross <clears throat> has these radically new characteristics. Number one, Worldly power is biased in the direction of rebellion. That's why it spoils people. Get hold of rebellious power and it's twisted in the direction of rebellion. No matter how godly the power holder is, he's got hold of something that, like the flesh, is enmity against God, is not subject to the will of God, and nor, nor can it be. He's radically, fatally flawed in the direction of rebellion. The power that flows from the cross is biased in the direction of obediency. Not my will but thine be done. That's the source of that power, see. Not my will but thine be done, that prayer in Gethsemane. Redeemed power is biased in the direction of obedience. Secondly, <coughs> redeemed power is power for people, not power over people. Let me show you something. <coughs> The role and task of leaders <clears throat> is actually to empower their people, to give power to their people. Now, our concept of power in an organization or in a church is that there is only a certain amount of power available, and that belongs at the top, <coughs> where the leaders are. <coughs> And you better not give any of that stuff away because if you give some of it away, you end up with less than you had before. What's more, if you put that kind of stuff in other people's hands down here, that'll give them a taste for power. And before you know what's happened, you're going to have a rebellion on your hands. And that happens in organizations time after time after time, doesn't it? Having the churches time after time after time. Put worldly power in the hands of people, it's what? It's corrupting. It's seductive, see. It's insatiable. Give people power, they want more power. But leaders are still meant to empower their people. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> if you are the leader or the leaders of 200 powerless people, how much power have you got? <clears throat> Very little, really. 
If you're the leader of 200 powerful people, how much power have you got? You've got a lot of power, see. And leaders are meant to empower their people, to make them more powerful, more autonomous, more free, more self-governing, more able, more capable, more fulfilled, more everything, see, to give power away there. The wonderful thing about redeemed power is you can give that stuff away and it multiplies. I can remember <clears throat> in the church I was involved in in New Zealand, we'd always operated under a team leadership, under an eldership. We never actually ever had, nor to this day have, the senior elder. We had a genuine, genuine <clears throat> uh, government by body of people. I've, I've met, uh, discovered only one other church in all the places I've been that functions like that. <clears throat> a church uh, in England, a fellowship down in Chichester, much bigger than ours actually. Anyway, a number of years ago, God spoke to us in one of our elders' meetings and said this, <clears throat> in the church, no person and no group of people should have all the power and nobody should be without any power. The thing that happens in most churches today is that 95% or more of the people feel powerless there. That's why they're so passive. You know, leaders are always complaining, aren't we, about how passive people are, how difficult it is for them to get involved in stuff. They're passive because they feel powerless. See? And leaders are meant to give their people power. See? But you better be careful the kind of power you're giving away. See? You give away unredeemed power and you've got a rebellion on your hands. See? <clears throat> give away redeemed powers, power biased in the direction of obedience, see? not in the direction of rebellion. It's the second thing. Third thing about redeemed power <coughs> is that it has settled the difference between means and ends. I'll explain what I mean by that. It has settled the difference forever between means and ends. Redeemed power has only one end. That end is the Father's glory. Therefore, it will strive for success with all its heart. But success is not the end. The only end is the Father's glory. It will seek to achieve results, but results are not the end. The only end is the Father's glory. It will aim for objectives and goals, but goals and objectives are not the end. The only end is the Father's glory. And if the Father's glory necessitates defeat and disaster and apparent failure, then so be it, as long as the Father gets the glory. Do you understand the difference? That's redeemed power. Finally, redeemed power has been to the cross. And at the cross has died out to all forms of self-seeking and the will to power. I'll say it again. It has been to the cross and has died out there to all forms of self-seeking and the will to power. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. And the word means utterly disown himself. Take up his cross and follow me. And when we come to the cross, we have access to that kind of power. And that kind of power is non-corrupting, see? Non-corrupting. <coughs> the second important significance of the cross as far as the powers are concerned... <coughs> is that Jesus has established his lordship over them. He has disarmed them, established his lordship over them. And I want us to see uh, for a few minutes <clears throat> the significance, what that means to us as far as the powers are concerned. The structural powers... are fallen, not demonic. They are the object of redemption. And recovery. <clears throat> Do you understand how many, if not all, of the words of the, uh, of the New Testament have to do with the theme of restoration? Restoring things to their original purpose? Redemption is buying back into freedom something that's gone into slavery. Regeneration is giving life back to something that's died. Reconciliation is restoring harmony amongst people who've got at odds with one another. 
Restoration is rebuilding something that was destroyed. Salvation is salvaging something that's gone into danger. The whole theme of the cross is restoring what sin has ruined. How far does redemption go? That's the critical point. Redemption has to go as far as sin has gone. See, The blood of Jesus has to go as far as sin has gone. And sin has gone not just into individual human lives or individual relationships, it's gone into the very structures of our society. There's evil in the systems. The city itself has fallen. There's a fallenness in the very air we breathe out there, see. And if sin abounds there, then grace much more abounds. This is the object of redemption. Change the structures. The demonic powers are the objects of judgment, not redemption. That's the level of warfare. <clears throat> now here's the critical thing. To unlock the city so that the city's changed, <clears throat> we need to operate on two fronts. Number one, we have to learn how to cast demons out of structures. Number two, we have to learn how to call the structures back to fulfill their rightful role in the kingdom of God. There are some commentators, and I think they're probably right, who believe that when Jesus cleansed the temple, he was actually doing just that. He was not just casting out the people who were changing money, he was casting mammon out of the temple. He was performing, if you like, a public exorcism. And he's calling the temple back to fulfill its rightful vocation to be a house of prayer for many nations. See? That's the role of spiritual warfare. Casting down the powers that rule the city and opening up, up the structures for redemptive change. Now in the past, you see, we've done either one of those things but not them both together. Therefore, therefore we failed. The liberal churches have under, understood the level of structural, uh, structural evil and they've tried to change the structures. The demonic powers will set the structures in concrete so they refuse to change and just grind the change agents to powder. See. We've wrongly supposed that if you have a born-again president in the United States, you can change a nation. You've discovered, <coughs> sadly, the, the results of that. See. The Charismatics and uh, Pentecostals understand a little, not nearly as much as they think they do, about spiritual warfare. But they've retreated from the structures, and again, nothing changes. In fact, as I mentioned before, if we take uh, Matthew chapter 12 seriously, and Jesus applies that passage to an entire generation, an entire society, if you cast the demons out of a structure and do not occupy it, you get seven demons in there, and the thing is worse than it was before. And I suspect that's what's happening uh, in some of our, in some of our uh, cities today. But if we deal with the demonic burden over the city, enter the city to redeem it and to change it, you can change a structure. <clears throat> now, the stage we're at in the church these days In terms of spiritual warfare, I think realistically we're still at the, <coughs> the level of guerrilla warfare. And the rule of guerrilla warfare is you get a bit of jungle that's small enough to attract to, not to attract too much attention and get yourself dug in there, get a bit you can take and defend. And if we're really serious <coughs> uh, about the recovery of the city, of, saving, saving a, of uh, redeeming the city, I think that's where we've got to begin. I look around for what I call winnable opportunities. Uh, situations that are small enough to make real and radical and permanent change. You remember when Joshua was going to lead the children of Israel <coughs> into, uh, into Canaan, God said to Joshua, I will not drive out your enemies all at once. 
because if I do, wild beasts will abound. I'll drive them out little by little. And we need to learn the law of occupation. What you take, you have to occupy. And uh, because of that, I believe we have to begin small. Think big, begin small. We've got, we've got to have a big vision, but we've got to begin small. And what it involves is dealing, is functioning, I believe, on, on those two dimensions. And if you function on those two levels, you can actually change a culture, the culture of a city. Probably be a small city to start off with, but it can be done. Let me give you an example from <clears throat> the church I was in in New Zealand uh, to show what I mean. Now this is, this, 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 this is small, and it's deliberately small because that's the level we need to learn to function at to begin with, I believe. In a little town uh, near us, there was a, uh, a school board which refused to have any religious instruction in the school. Now, legally in New Zealand, the uh, primary education system is secular, but with the consent of a school board, they can have a voluntary uh, time of biblical instruction once a week. A minister or somebody comes in and can take, take those classes. This particular little town is the, uh, the marijuana capital of that strip of coast. It's full of uh, new age people, uh, all sorts of counterculture groups and so on, and they dominate the, dominated the board of the school. And they said there will never ever be any religious brainwashing in the school. And they re resisted over the years any attempts to introduce Bible to schools into that school. One day a young fellow came to me uh, who goes to our church, his, parent, his children go to that school, and he said, Tom, he said, I, don't, I don't think we need to put up with that. He said, we could take those guys on. We could beat them. So I said, all right, you do your work on the ground. I'll get the church to pray. You deal with the structures. Try and bring the structures to heal. We'll deal with the demonic powers behind that little school board resisting the gospel. So we did it in those two levels. Now, to begin with, as far as their attempts to get the structures to change, to change they were totally inept politically. I mean, the other guys just made them look silly. But they stuck to their task, and by and by, they managed to get a, a motion through a public meeting that uh, they should have a referendum of all the parents. And if a majority of parents said, yes, I'd like Bible in schools, then the school board would have to accede to that decision. The board agreed to it because knowing the town, they were pretty confident a referendum would never, never get anywhere. So uh, they, uh, they uh, approached a lot of the, the parents. They really did a thorough job on the ground. In the meantime, we were praying against the demonic powers over the, over the, uh, over the little school. When the results of the referendum came out, 52% of the parents were in favor of Bible in schools. 48% either didn't vote or voted against. So they went back to the school board with the results of this referendum, 52% for, 48% against or, or neutral. In the meantime, the, the school board did some figuring of their own, and they discovered that if you took not the number of families who voted, but if you counted up the number of children in those families who voted or who didn't vote, you could actually get a result that said only 49% of the children represented were from families that wanted Bible in schools, and 51% were against. So they said, you know, referendum's lost. They've changed the rules in the, in the, in the meantime. Anyway, round about that time, in our praying against the, the powers over, this, over the, the uh, little school, we, 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 we realized we got a breakthrough. Yes? So something was really broken in the heavenlies. Shortly after that, the election for the new school board came along, comes along every two years. So a whole bunch of the uh, Christian parents put their names forward as candidates, and the other bunch had their candidates. When the results of the election came out, out of the six members of the new board, five of them are Christians. And they have changed the culture of the school. It's better financially, it's better educationally, it's better socially. It's a different school. Now the point I want to make about that is not the size of the operation, it's this. If we had prayed all we like, but not got involved in the structures, nothing would have changed. See? If we tried to get a majority of Christians on the board, and not prayed about this thing here, nothing would have changed. Deal with those two dimensions, <coughs> and you can change the structure. Uh, I could give you a couple more examples of that, but we, we haven't got time. But the principle, I believe, is true, that we need to tackle this, uh, this thing in uh, both dimensions. 
<clears throat> I remember reading a book uh, some time ago uh, referring to uh, William Stringfellow. Anybody read any w William Stringfellow's books? <clears throat> I think he's real, one of your real American prophets. He wrote a marvelous little book called An Ethic for Christians in an Alien Land. But this book uh, said that uh, shortly after Richard Nixon's second inauguration, <clears throat> William Stringfellow was preaching in an ecumenical service in New York. And at the end of the service, he led the congregation in a public exorcism of the Oval Office. Daring thing to do. Between uh, <clears throat> about 10 to 12 days later, the whole Watergate thing blew up. I was in, uh, in uh, London <clears throat> some years ago, and I took part, because I happened to be there, in one of the early marches for Jesus. It began at the Thames and Bank, went up past the Stock Exchange, the Law Courts, the House of Parliament, so on. About 30,000 people, I think, were there at that time, many more nowadays. Uh, very English it was, <coughs> uh, very organized, uh, divided into sections, and every section marched up and they stopped and they made certain declarations uh, and sang some songs like, You powers in the heavens above bow down, you powers on earth beneath bow down, so on. Uh, but I did that seven times in each of those places. And it was shortly after, I think within days of that happening, one of the major scandals on the British Stock Exchange blew open, the whole Guinness scandal blew open. What's happening? <clears throat> the demonic powers have been lifted off there and the structures are open for change. Now, <clears throat> that's spiritual warfare. In terms of the structures themselves, Let me just mention quickly these critical things, then we'll have to, have to stop. <clears throat> One is that we, we need to live in the structures. I'm talking about the secular, fallen structures in the city. They're part of our life. As Christians, we can live in the structures, serve their legitimate ends, but not bow to their idolatrous drive. That's because of the Lordship of Jesus. We can live in the structures, we can serve their legitimate ends like Daniel or Joseph and refuse to bow the knee. Secondly, when we're doing that, we must never allow the structures, the powers, to dictate our value system, our standards, as they will try to do. We have to maintain our integrity as believers. And thirdly, we should aspire to positions of influence where it's possible to change the structures. And that, I believe, is what uh, Tom, uh, who will be here on Friday, will be illustrating. I'm looking forward to hearing that. I, I think there's a lot, lot to glean there, see. So we're called to live in the structures to influence them in the, in the direction of righteousness. Sometimes when I talk about this, people say, well, you can't expect to have a perfect business system until Jesus comes. Neither will we. Well, I'll tell you something, we can have a redeemed one, though. You're redeemed, but you're not perfect. Your marriage is probably redeemed, not perfect, but it's redeemed. Same with your family. If you can have a redeemed but not perfect individual, and a redeemed but not perfect marriage, and a redeemed but not perfect family, why can't you have a redeemed but not yet perfect business system, or political system, or educational system? I believe you can. I believe that's God's heart for the city in, in our day. Thank you.